Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucy, and some of you know me as Triangle Investor from X. I have a little bit different guest this time. His name is Alberto Alvarez Gonzalez. Uh, you will find out more about him in a few moments. But before we do that, I want to say uh, Alberto is really smart uh, guy. And there are a lot of smart people out there in commodity and investing uh, space whose content is really a big treasure. And those people are sometimes underfollowed or not recognized 100%. One of those guys is definitely Alberto. Great follow, great content. So Alberto, welcome to my show. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Uh, let's give my audience an introduction of you, your origin story, and what are you doing right now? All right. So... Um... For, con for context, I'm 27 years old. Um, I started investing when I was 14. So I've, uh, I started really early. And um, I started with a really small amount of money. And um, I made a lot of mistakes, uh, especially when I was uh, a lot younger. Yeah. Um, when I was about uh, 20, uh, I was starting the mining business, uh, particularly silver and gold. And I found out about uranium and I put my, all my money into it, basically. And by 2022, um, I made a thousand uh, percentage uh, return on my portfolio. And uh, I quit my job and I decided to go full time as an investor. And um, I mean, that's the main part of my story, uh, I would say. Um, a few months ago, I decided that I wanted to share how I pick stocks uh, with the world and perhaps help out a few people out there who are new to this uh, to this business. And I decided to open a blog. Um, it's completely free um, and you get, I mean, you get all the content without paying anything. And I basically publish um, something in my blog whenever I find something interesting. Uh, it may take a month for me to publish something. It may take a week. Um, it may take two months. <laughs> yeah. uh, but unless I find something interesting, I, I will not um, release anything. Um, I think that uh, content is uh, the uh, utmost important thing. And in that sense, um, I appreciate my subscribers' patience with me. And uh, yeah, like uh, I don't publish on a weekly basis or anything like that. Uh, I publish whenever I find something interesting and something that I, I am putting my money into. That's a great story. Uh, your Substack is uh, alberto.ag.substack.com, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my handle is uh, at uh, AAG Research, uh, both in Substack and on Twitter. Yeah, I saw your content and I really, really like your content. And like you said, you are not publishing all the time. You are publishing when you have the time. So, and you are publishing the right stuff and smart stuff. Uh, before we touch on the certain commodities, uh, can you explain to me your, actually your investment philosophy? Uh, how do you approach investing? Are you a speculator? Are you a contrarian, day trader, week trader? What kind of investor are you? I'm definitely not a day trader. I would say I base my investments on fundamentals. And unfortunately, I do take some pleasure in being a contrarian, which isn't very profitable at times. Um, but generally, I would say that I'm a value investor. I, I just try to buy stuff below what it's worth and wait it out. And my horizon for investment is around five years. So five years horizon that, uh, let's say you are a long-term then investor. You are not playing uh, short-term uh, short plays, right? So if you, let's say if you invest in a company and you have 100% or 200% gain in six months, will you sell the stock or you're playing it for a long term? It, it depends. Um, for example, in uranium, I let a few of my stocks run into 1500% gains because, um, I thought that the market wasn't fully valuing the stock. Um, 
So, I mean, uh, I can talk a few examples. Um, if you want, like, for example, um, some of my best returns were in Bannerman resources or in Global Atomic, um, which are two very known, very well-known stocks in uranium. And um, in both of them, I did a thousand percentage uh, plus return uh, simply because um, at the bottom of the market in 2020, the market, the, these companies were trading at more than 90% uh, discount to net present value. So to get to net present value, they had to go up a thousand percent, a thousand percent, sorry. Um, but to use your example, if I think a, a company is um, valued at a 50% less than what it's trading at, I would be happy with 100% return and I would sell it, sell it out. So my answer to your question would be, it depends on how much I think the market, the company is valued at and, and what, what it is priced at. Uh, yeah. So when, when those two match, I am happy to sell. Yeah, it makes sense. So with Uranium, you entered in 2017 and you exited in 2022 with, and you exited fully. You don't have any uh, Uranium names in the portfolio right now. Um, I exited completely and a bit later I decided to buy physical uranium and maybe two months or no, um, a bit more, uh, four months ago, I bought, uh, a speculative bet into a company called district metals. Mm -hmm. So basically I own physical uranium and I own uh, a small portion of my portfolio into a speculative bet. Mm -hmm. Uh, what actually attracted you to uranium? 2017 and my question also do do you plan to enter a, a uranium again in in larger quantities uh no i mean um once i've um i've left an investment thesis um with profit i don't usually go back in unless circumstances change a lot um so i mean uh i mean you have to understand that um, when I started investing in uranium uh, back in 2017, um, Global Atomic was trading for 40 cents. So for me to get back in now, that is trading at two, $2 or more, I'm not sure. No, uh, it's the dollar $1.20. It had a big, big pullback uh, because of the Niger situation. It's like dollar twenty right now. Yeah, I mean, even a dollar twenty, like it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Uh, um, more so now with all the Niger um, risk, uh, I'm not even sure Global Atomic is going to be the owner of that asset going forward or who is going to be the owner. I mean, is it going to be the Russians, the Chinese? Um, so to answer your question, uh, what did I see in Uranium in 2017? Yeah, I saw a market that 20 years from now, 40 years from now, was going to have a bright future, which is nu nuclear energy. Um, and I realized that every single producer except Kassatom Brom was selling pounds at a loss. So every day they were, they were losing money. Um, and that didn't really make sense to me. Um, I quickly realized um, that I was probably early into the market uh, just by seeing Prior, uh, because uh, I found out about this thesis through a YouTube video, funny enough. Um, and by watching videos of prior years, I realized that I was pretty early in. Like, I mean, in 2015, miners were saying, this is going to be the year. In 2016, they were, they were saying, this is going to be the year. In 2017, they were saying, this is going to be the year. And I was like, I mean, these guys have been mistaken before. So they're probably mistaken now. Um, nevertheless, I did, I decided to put all my money into uranium. And it paid out well for you. What gains uh, did you have with uranium names? I, I, you don't have to tell me the whole names you sold, but let's say an average gain, average gains on uranium place. A, th a thousand percent. A thousand percent. Okay. Yeah, a thousand, a th a thousand percent. Um, that said, there was a lot of pain in the way because from 2017 to 2020, I lost like 50% of my money. 
Um, so yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was a, a very pa painful journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that time. Uh, so let's say uh, you love the com you love the commodities that are hated, like just like Rick Roll says. Uh, the best investments for him in his life in his investment career were in commodities that are really unloved. Is that your play as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that like unloved commodities and unloved stocks in general um, offer some of the best opportunities. Yeah, definitely. Agreed. What's your take on gold equities? Do you hold them? Do you, do you have any gold equities in your portfolio? Um, I have four gold equities or equities that have some leverage to the gold price. Um. I think that gold is in a very um, special situation, um, both in macro terms and in supply and demand. Uh, so I would say that is the, my one exception. I mean, uh, I would never buy a commodity into an all-time high, but I think gold is an exception to the rule. Okay. Uh, would you say the same for silver or not? Um. At the moment, in my personal account, I hold no silver stocks, but um, I'm more than willing uh, to put some money to work uh, in that area. Um, but to be honest, silver miners are making some money at these prices. I mean, they're not making a lot, um, but also I think your, um, your listeners should take into account that there are basically no, no silver producers nowadays like you have copper producers producing silver you have gold miners producing silver uh but you don't have any primary um uh, silver producer i mean first majestic silver pan american silver uh the only primary thing they have with silver is their name um other than that they're mainly gold producers yeah uh what about copper are you playing copper do you have uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think copper is going to be a great long-term bet. I am pretty sure there's going to be some turmoil in the short term, um, probably due to bad economic conditions and perhaps something odd going on in China. Uh, but yeah, my my top pick in mining is actually a, a, a copper producer called Aero Copper. Um, so yeah, I, I am definitely bullish on, uh, on copper. Okay. I asked you about silver, gold, copper, and uranium, but can you, can you tell me what are you holding right now in your portfolio? You mentioned one stock. Uh, how is your, actually, how is your portfolio structured today? What percentage of what commodities do you have in your portfolio? So I would say that. My, I mean, my number one stock is not a mining stock. Uh, it's a an a UK stock um that um helps companies going uh going into bankrupt bankruptcy, uh called Manalete Partners. But uh, we can talk about that in a different uh podcast if you want. Sure. So I would say that right now my number one um size sizing our portfolio in terms of commodities are gold and copper mm -hmm. um i have some platinum and palladium in my portfolio but i'm adding very slowly because i think that just like in uranium in 2017 we're probably right now in the er early innings of a platinum and palladium um uh cycle uh, i think that it's going to go up a lot five years from now but who knows what's what will the price is going to be one year from now? Yeah, so PGA are a contrarian play for you right now, right? Yeah, I think PGMs are definitely a is definitely a contrarian play right now, and it's a very very difficult um thesis to play in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, can you tell me about other commodities that you are currently bullish on? And of course, is there are there any commodities that you are bearish on right now? Um, so yeah, I I'm not sure coal prices are sustainable uh, right now. I think a lot of coal production 
uh, went online after 2021 and 2022. Um, some Coke stocks did uh, uh, 10x and some uh, Coke stocks did even 20x uh, from the 2020 lows. And I think a lot of uh, production went online. So I'm not really bullish on coal or lithium. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of lithium out there, a lot of lithium output. And my only exposure to lithium is an explorer uh, because explorers don't really care about um, the price. I mean, like you would never buy an exploration company uh, to get leverage to the metal. Uh, you buy an exploration company for exploration success. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. Like, uh, I think that five years from now, everything is going to be uh, probably higher uh, in the periodic table. Um, I think that for many years, uh, the industry has underinvested in mining, and we're just in the beginning of seeing the consequences of this. Yeah, so we are we are in for a commodity super cycle. I agree on that. Uh, also, uh, Alberto, tell me more about your due diligence process. How do you evaluate companies? What metrics and sources do you use for that? So my approach is very much bottom up. Um, I recently uh, put out in my blog uh, a report on how I actually approach mining uh, and investing. And one of the phrases that I use is uh, choose the company and not the narrative. Um, so I will set you an example, if that's okay. Yeah, um, in 2017, uh, when I started in Uranium, uh, there were around 70 to 80 companies Uranium-related in the world. By 2020, there were between 40 and 50. So around 30 companies or 40 companies had either gone bankrupt or they had changed their business model of Uranium. So even if you're right about the narrative, even if you're, if, even if you're right about um, which metal you want to invest in, you have to be even more right about the company. And I think that is critical. I think that uh, commodity investors should not be thinking in terms of, hey, like gold is going to go up. I'm going to buy barrack gold just for the sake of it. I think that you should be very careful when choosing which company you want to buy because chances are that uh, if you're a contrarian, most companies are going to go broke. Um, so in that sense, I try to look um, for one or two things. Uh, if I'm going to buy a producer, I want exceptional management, very low costs, and good infrastructure. And, of course, a good jurisdiction. Um, because you don't want your asset nationalized or you don't want uh, guerrillas and uh, mafias uh, running your mind, you know? Um you want your mind run by management, by good management. That yeah. that on the producer side. On yeah. the developer side, uh, I'm looking for very large deposits with very high grade, um, good metallurgy, so very good recoveries, good management, so management that has built mines before or that they have um, sold companies to large mining companies before yeah and, but yeah, yeah. sorry Please. Yeah, and, and of course a good location uh, uh i mean jurisdiction is a massive part of uh, of uh, investment success yeah agreed what about the other metrics let's say skin in the game uh, marketing strategy uh, money in the bank are those things important to you as well when you are doing due diligence on the company if you're going to buy a developer, um, the developer should have money in the bank to last 18 to 24 months. Um, because, you know, um, the future is unpredictable. And you don't, wanna, you, you don't want your developer to be raising money six months from now if metal prices have plummeted 50%. Um, because that's going to kill you. 
And um, so you want uh, the company to have a lot of cash in hand. And um, I mean, I, I think that, that is just critical. Um, and and yeah, like, honestly, like, if you go, if, if you buy at the bottom of the cycle, a good deposit with money in the bank, good management, good location, I mean, you're just going to make money. Uh, it's just that it's really hard to find. <laughs> yeah, that's a jackpot what you said. So a good company at the at the lows with a lot of money in the bank, that's really hard to find. But yes, there are companies out there if you are a contrarian and you really believe in the thesis of that commodity and you really are investing in it. So there are companies that you can find. That's my investment philosophy for, for the last 15, 20 years. Alberto, what about exploration companies? How do you evaluate the company with no prior exploration work or very little? How can you evaluate the exploration company? Management. Uh, I think management is number one there. Um, you want people that have discovered mines before. Um, you want exceptional people, basically. Um, just, to, just to set you an example, um, I own a company called Radius Gold. Um, is run by uh, a gentleman called uh, Simon Ridgway. And uh, Simon doesn't have a university degree. Um, he emigrated to North America decades ago, and he basically learned geology by sh shadowing uh, geologists. And um, he discovered Cerro Blanco, which is now Bluestone, owned by uh, Landine, he discovered one of the one of the veins that is now the Escobal Escobal mine owned by Pan American, which is a massive silver deposit, and he built Fortuna silver mines from scratch. Um, by the time he left Fortuna, um, the he had returned uh, twenty two hundred percent in shareholder appreciation to shareholders. I mean, just an amazing uh, entrepreneur. So you want that kind of people. Um, number two, um, you want cash in the bank, a lot of it, if you can. Or you want a large mining company financing a lot of the uh, exploration uh, work because exploration is very, very expensive, is very, very risky. Chances are you're never going to find anything. Uh, so you either want the cash to, be, to already be there or you want a large guy to finance all the exploration. Yeah, I get that part. So the management is really important. I agree on that. But what about geology? I know that you are not a geo. So how do you look at the results of the company exploration works that they are doing at, at their properties? Do you ask for advice from your colleagues, uh, geos, or do you do you do your own due diligence? Uh, and do you, you you probably already have some basics in the uh, in, in, in in geo? So, how do you approach that part? So, I mean um, the geology part. That, yeah, of course. Um, I already have some um geology um experience and knowledge, so I can more or less assess um how successful a drilling campaign has been has been. Um, that said, I also consult with geologists on um, how the drill results were. Um, but honestly, like you can learn this, uh, a lot of this um, by yourself. I mean, yeah. if the, if the, I mean, just the other day, one subscriber was asking me about this company who intercepted one meter of gold at something like a hundred grams per ton. And it's just, yeah, like, the 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 grade is amazing. A hundred ton, a hundred uh, a hundred grams per ton is like out of this world. But one meter is nothing. It's so you want continue you want continuity in your drill intercepts. Um, you also want good metallurgy. So um, you should look for nearby mines to see if the metallurgy and the mineralization is similar. Um. Also, in terms of geology, you should be looking at what is actually contained in that drill intercept. So are we looking at uh, visible gold? 
or are we looking at types of mineralization that hold gold, zinc, lead, silver? Um, because if you're looking at that, that is really dangerous um, because maybe you're looking at different techniques to, to extract each metal, which won't be very economical. Um, so in that sense, um, all the ounce equivalent or pound equivalent uh, measures, uh, you should take those with a grain of salt. Um, Agreed. um, because uh, a, a lot of a lot of those measures are are really um, worth nothing. Um, um, you should be looking at can this um, can this gold, can this silver be extracted from that mineral? And honestly, just like uh, look it up, look it up in Google. <laughs> uh, look yeah. at mines. Look at mines that are already operating that have the kind of mineralization. How are their economics? Um, so yeah, I mean, um, oh, good it, point. A really, really good point. Uh, what about red flags? What are some red flags that really keeps you away from a company or? some red flags that you noticed during the holding of some stock so you decided to sell it uh, when you see that kind of red flag what are your red flags with uh, when doing due diligence on the company uh so yeah like very high employee uh compensation uh that is a really red flag especially if we were talking developers or explorers um you don't want your ceo to be paid a million dollars a year when you have no cash flow. I mean, that makes no sense. Um, in developers and explorers, you want the money that the company raised to go into the project. Um, I've seen companies spend more on marketing than on exploration. They spend more on professional fees than on exploration. I mean, that makes no sense. Uh, Radius Gold, for example, on 2023, they spent 10 times more money on exploration than on em employee compensation. That is a really good sign. Um, more red flags. Um, if you're looking at a developer or early stage, early stage producer and they have sold a royalty on their main metal, that is a big red flag. I mean... Um, in the report yesterday, I pointed out how uh, McEwen Mining, at their gold bar project, they have sold a gold royalty there. So that means that a lot of the leverage and profitability of that project is gone away because royalties are really expensive. What you want is the company to sell royalties on the secondary metals. So, for example, Generation Mining, my top pick in PGMs, they sold a royalty on the gold and part of the platinum of their deposit. Why? Because the project owned by Generation is primarily uh, a, palladium, a palladium project. That's where the economics come from. So they can afford to sell gold and part of the platinum without affecting their profitability or their leverage to PGM practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Alberto, who are the people from commodity and investing space that you respect the most and listen to their advices, so to say, some market experts? Who are those people that you really like? I mean, I'm going to sound really negative, but I don't I, I don't like anyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's a good answer. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you believe in your own due diligence, so you don't have to listen to anybody's advice, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you have like several um, segments in the newsletter world when it comes to mining. Uh, you have newsletters that are focused in uh, producing mines, others in exploration, others in uh, development. And I mean, I can tell you one by one. I mean, exploration is the toughest business in the world. Um Probably one of the best guys out there in terms of exploration is uh, Joe Masumder at Exploration Insights. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and if you look at his returns, he, he's not consistent. And he's probably the best human brand cook. So, like, I mean, like, 
what makes you think that if you have like 50% or more of your portfolio in exploration, that you're going to make any money? You're probably going to go broke. Um, that's why I have maybe 5% of my portfolio into exploration stocks. Um, because I think it's really a gamble. Um, if you're going to look for developers, you have to time the cycle perfectly. And I don't think anyone can do that. To be honest, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, yeah, I I think you can do as much as as much as of a good job as a geologist could at timing the the cycle. I mean, like for example, Joe Masumder, um, I think he missed a lot in the uranium um cycle because he 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 his mindset, uh, at least what I've seen in interviews, was that there's a lot of uranium out there. So he only had, I think, one or two uranium stocks in his portfolio. So even for geologists to time this cycle, it's almost impossible. Uh, I think that if you do your proper due diligence, you're going to do a good job. And then on the last stage, producing mines, running a mine is rocket science. Like, it really is. Like, um, look at B2 Gold. Uh, they just Their stock just plummeted on about a quarter. Uh, look at Newman, look at Barrett. Gold prices are at $2,500 um, uh, an ounce today, all-time highs. But Barrick stock, Newman stock, it's far away from all-time highs. And these guys, I mean, I think that Bristow, the CEO of Barrick, is probably the best uh, uh, gold mining CEO out there. And yet he's not able to reflect on the stock price, um, the, the gold prices. So um, I'm not a big believer in buying um, miners. Uh, I think that miners have a terrible track record at um, delivering uh, returns on higher, on higher metal prices. I think that developers, if you buy them at the bottom of the cycle, um, have a much better chance of delivering some returns, uh, but gold miners, yeah, they have a terrible track record. Yeah, Alberto, let's finish this with the question: How can people reach out to you and subscribe? Uh, so my handle, uh, both in Substack and um, Twitter, is at AAG Research. And my Substack website is um, albertoag.substack.com. Uh, so you can reach me anytime there. You can send me a message and I'll be happy to talk to you. Excellent. Alberto, thank you for coming to my show. It was a great chat and looking forward to host you again next time. Thank you. Thank you so much.